Uh, welcome to the May 5th, 2021 meeting of the Dover, Sherborne and Dover, Sherborne School Committees. Tonight we'll interview the two finalist candidates for the position of interim superintendent for the Dover, Sherborne Public Schools for the 2021-22 academic year. Thank you to the Dover and Sherborne Boards of Health for their guidance and cooperation in allowing the school committees to meet our finalist candidates in person for the interviews this evening. These interviews are being live streamed and recorded by Dover Sherburne Cable Television to allow public access, consistent with the open meeting law and with Governor Baker's executive order dated March 12, 2020. I would now like to hand it over to Kate Potter. Thank you. Hello again. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming out and it's so wonderful to see people in person. Um, some of you I only met for the first time five minutes ago, which is amazing as we've been Zooming all year. Um, thank you, Ms. Smith, for joining us and um, to the folks at home who are watching. We do have three school committee members who are watching from the Zoom who couldn't be here with us due to family issues. Um, so, Ms. Smith, I just wanted to let you know that this is going to be similar to our other interview. Um, we'll do some quick introductions and then um, I'll give you some time to say hello to us and let us know um, your thoughts about this role and then we'll go into our questions and leaving time at the end for your questions. Thank you. So if that sounds good. Um, Angie, do you want to introduce yourself and we'll just kind of go across? Sure. Hi, I'm Angie Johnson and I'm the chair of the Sherburn School Committee. And I'm Kate Potter, the um, chair of the interim search team, and I'm on the regional school committee. Hi, I'm Dan Covey, and I'm on the regional school committee. I'm Lynn Collins, I'm on the regional school committee. Hi, I'm Sarah Sakira Dunn, I'm on the Dover School Committee, and I'm a member of the search team. Hi, I'm Maggie Sharon, I'm the chair of the regional school committee, and I've been a member of the interim search team as well. Nice to see you again. Hi, I'm Liz Grossman, and I'm a member of the Dover School Committee. I am Shoba Fry. I'm a member of the Regional School Committee. Hi, I'm Leslie Leon. I am the chair of the Dover School Committee. Uh, I'm Judy Miller. Earlier, I am uh, vice chair of the Regional School Committee. Hi, I'm Colleen Burt, and I'm on the Dover School Committee. I'm Dennis Wong, and I'm on the Dover School Committee. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, so, Ms. Smith, if you would like to open up with a few words and after that we can get to our questions. Thank you, Kate. I, I appreciate it. I hope you're comfortable. Uh, I know in interviewing and truly understand the mandates, but I hope uh, with the distance uh, you are comfortable with me taking off my mask so that I can project and, and answer your questions. Sure. So I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, at first I was surprised, first of all, that we could have such a large gathering, but things are opening up. Uh, even as I serve as interim superintendent in Weymouth, we're starting to try to move forward slowly but safely. And that being said, uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciated actually meeting your teams today. It was really refreshing to sit down, have a discussion with an administrative assistant, with your uh, assistant superintendent, your district leaders. Um, it, it just it, it felt uh, very helpful to be able to just have a dialogue uh, with educators and to clearly understand some of the things happening in Dover Sherborne. Did I ever think I would be here? No, I didn't. And, and I say that because I, I know you have my resume and I'm going to tell you, you know, things happen in careers that you just don't expect. And if you've looked at my resume, uh, obviously you see that I was in the Brockton Public Schools for 42 years. 42 very exciting years, uh, starting out as a 22-year-old teacher in 1977. You can do the math. Um, and loved, uh, I didn't grow up in Brockton. I went to Cardinal Spellman High School. And at the time, all those years ago, it was the only place I wanted to be. It was a city filled with diversity, diversity of cultures. It's obviously a very changed city at this point. But I knew that that was the right place for me to be an educator. And never was I disappointed. You know, when you look at somebody for 42 years, you probably think to yourself, you know, isn't, is this not a risk taker? You know, this person remained in, in the same district. Well, I want to tell you very differently. I really see myself as a risk taker. And when I talk about the district having, having been a teacher and you can see the many different roles, 
all of those roles led me to where I ended up, you know, being a classroom teacher and at one point working in a junior high, a substantially separate classroom for seventh and eighth graders, uh, kids that had very serious reading disabilities. One of the things I found, I spent quite a bit of my time, was working on their self-esteem. These were kids that were good athletes, good musicians, could take a car apart and put it back together in no time, but truly had obviously difficulty with dyslexia, et cetera. And I found myself spending my time not only as an educator, making sure that they were able to achieve, doing everything I could to make sure that they were able to meet the standards to move forward, but also creating a sense of true self-esteem in, in making them feel that they could achieve those things. They could go on and be successful as adults, and many of them stay in touch with me to this day. I say that because I ended up getting my master's degree as a counselor, school adjustment counselor, guidance counselor. And again, Brockton Public Schools provided me with opportunities from kindergarten all the way up through high school, being able to support their youth. At some point along the line, I became really disgruntled because I would spend a lot of time preparing for students that were in the court system for a number of re reasons, non-attenders, I would do home assessments, create all kinds of documents, and I would hand them over to the public defenders, God love them, who would be working with many of these youngsters that they were assigned to. And I tell you that story because when I talk about being a risk taker, I came home one evening, 36 years old, mother of two little kids, my husband also an educator, and said to my husband, I want to go to law school. Talk to him about my reasons for saying that, and for the first time in my life he said, no, you know, how could we possibly do that? I won't go into the story here. I actually shared it with a lot of your administrators today and had fun with it, but I want you to know in the end, I ended up in law school. I did a four year evening program. I taught full time. I brought up two little uh, children, 37 and 35 years old now, very su successful young women. And it allowed me, again, at the time I had wonderful opportunities in boutique labor law firms, working on uh, initiatives supporting children and families. And in the end, I had had a number of years in the educational system that I thought I would leave after maybe 20 years, practice law. Well, that never happened because what happened in this state with ed reform in the early 90s, and especially in a place like Brockton, which truly was a, a failing district on a number of levels when you talk about MCAS coming in. I say that because what happened was I then had opportunities. I worked with a superintendent out of Boston that believed in me. And we ended up with a lot of um, academic support money at the time for students to pass the high stakes testing. And in my hands was a $3 million grant. And it was OK. Start to develop programs, start to develop curriculum, start to work with families, start to look at weekend programs. How do we narrow that achievement gap? Well, certainly I was part of a much bigger team in Brockton. And narrow that achievement gap, we did. And as an urban district, it was a renowned urban district. We continue to have challenges to this day. But I say that to you because it was just exciting opportunities all along the way. I ended up, and again, I thought I would leave to practice law and had the opportunity to go for the superintendency in 2013. Um, ended up uh, getting the superintendency, remained there for six years, and I was excited to be able to come on. You have such a vision when you know the district inside and out, and you've worked at every level of the system and you know what it means to bring families on board as, as stakeholders and empower them to do what they need to do for their children, all the while a very changing community in Brockton. Well, lo and behold, when I came on as superintendent, little did I realize the challenges that I would face along the way. The six years was invigorating. I felt I made a difference in the community that I loved, and, and I know that I will not take up the time because I'm sure some of the answers I have will really define me as an educator and a superintendent in Brockton as we speak tonight. But you must be saying to yourself, you know, interim superintendent, never once did I think I would be an interim superintendent. And I say that because my goals were simple. When I retired, I hoped to enjoy some retirement time, but absolutely felt I wasn't ready to walk away from the educational system. My hope was to mentor younger superintendents, to get involved in a number of those programs to support different initiatives, strategic planning. And lo and behold, you will hear me talk about the advocacy that I was able to work with superintendents across the state, urban districts, rural, suburban districts, all about what is now called the Student Opportunity Act. Along that way, I served on panels throughout the state. 
and one person I met was the mayor out of Salem, a very progressive uh, mayor, uh, Kim Driscoll. And I received a phone call from Mayor Driscoll and she said to me, Kathy, I have a situation. Um, we have a, a spot for an interim superintendent and I'd like you to come and be the interim superintendent. And now I'm a South Shore girl. And I, I said to myself, you know, Salem, I, I'm not going to do that trek. I'm not going to travel back and forth every day. And sat down, had conversations with their school committee members, um, felt it was, strongly felt it was a district I could make a difference. And I ended up relocating there for a year with the blessing of my husband and family. And it was an experience. And it was something that I wouldn't have done. You hear me talk about being in a district for 42 years. Although there were challenges, you know, I, I certainly felt comfortable in my surroundings, knew the school committee members, you know, knew the families, even with a district as large as Brockton. So to all of a sudden go to a new place and clearly understand what my role was. And my role was to build a strong culture. The morale had been low. There had been some issues with the school committee and letting go a superintendent. And at the end of that time in Salem, to this day, I keep in touch with members from Salem. I feel that I have made a difference. I think I shared with the screening committee in going through old documents. When I looked at, and after the pandemic hit last March, there were a couple of goodbye messages close to the end of June last year. And they were from teachers. And when teachers tell you that you made a difference and the amount of time that you were there, and they can articulate all the reasons why, sometimes you, you don't even realize the effect that you have. You feel like, it might have been an adventure for me, and boy, was it an adventure. Little did I realize what was going to happen. But in the end, I truly felt like I made a difference as an interim superintendent. I was happy to go back to the Cape. I can't pretend that I didn't enjoy having in the middle of the craziness of the pandemic, but I still felt I wasn't done. And when the opportunity arose in Weymouth, and you realize that I came in um, in the really the middle of January, took over uh, in February, and there has been a lot of work. And again, I hope I get an opportunity to talk about some of that work. Again, it was looking at some issues. And when a superintendent leaves in the middle of the year, there's a lot of anxiety with your leadership, you know, with staff. You know, this person is going to be here for a short period of time. And I feel best when I look at right now, the school committee members gave me five priorities. I call them big rocks. One was we need to get the kids back to school. And there had been some issues with, with really getting some momentum and we have kids back to school and I'm happy to talk about that. The other was getting a budget passed. And it sounds easy, but there had been some contentious discussion a year ago in the middle of the pandemic with a full day kindergarten program. I am so pleased to sit here right now and tell you to work with my team, with my, my assistant superintendent of business and operations, to work with Mayor Hedlund in Weymouth, who in just a recent article, I was so pleased to read the headlines after what I understood went on last year during a budget process. Not only did the mayor in the paper state it has been a pleasure working with interim superintendent Kathleen Smith and her team to get to the final result we have this year. We're looking forward to bringing full day K on board. And I want you to know that took a lot of work and there was a lot of relationship building, sharing of data, sharing of information. It still isn't passed yet, so I probably should be very careful what I'm saying. But I say that because I feel at this point that, and I have you know, obviously some time left, that Weymouth is in a position to, they're gonna be opening a brand new uh, middle school. Uh, I think they're, they're ready to you know, really move on a lot of their initiatives. And I feel very pleased at number one, for me to come on board because I have gained so much. You know, Being able to feel like at this point in my career, I have made a difference. So I want you to see that because you know, I really couldn't have told you what, uh, I remember in Salem, somebody said to me, one of the school committee members when I met them in small groups. And they said, you know, we don't want an, uh, an interim superintendent who um, is a seat warmer or, or something, uh, you know, on that idea. You know, I assure you, I'm not a seat warmer. I've never been a seat warmer. You know, if I come in, I hope, uh, even though sometimes I think at the end of the day, I've had it, <laughs> where, you know, certainly when I look at being a little bit younger, I, I probably had a lot more energy. But I assure you, I have a lot of energy to, to get through um, the hard tasks ahead as, as an interim superintendent. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. All right, Leslie. Okay, thank you for that, that was wonderful. Um, 
The first question we have for you is, could you please describe how you've worked with your current team to educate children during the pandemic? How would you envision helping our community, students, teachers, families heal and move forward next year? Okay. I think I have it all. I couldn't write that quickly, but... Um, you want me to say it again? No, I th let me, uh, if I need, I'll ask. Okay. Um, you first of all asked how I'm working with my current team. So again, I talked about the challenge of coming in midstream, but one thing that I realized uh, for the couple of weeks I had during what I call a transition was I got to see a school committee meeting. I watched 30 parents do hearing of the visitors, very displeased with what they felt was a lack of progress on returning to school. Now Weymouth again had brought back a lot of their special education students or did a good job looking at students individually that might have been suffering social emotional. They, they got back students. I think the principals actually did an excellent job. Our high school, we had very few kids coming back. A lot of kids were, although, although they were signing up to do hybrid, they were staying home doing remote learning and I would say was really a struggle as far as being successful. So after seeing a lot of that, taking in as much information, because you have to do that very quickly, there's really no time to transition in for an interim superintendent. I brought together, and when I say brought together, please understand, just like you, a lot of the principals, when I'm going out into the buildings finally, I'm seeing them for the first time. So we've been on Zoom, we've been collaborating, and one of the things I had to assess very quickly was how do I bring teams together and how do we start to have movement? So it's going to sound simple, but we started to bring together what we called a return to school team. And at each school, the one thing that I wanted to happen was the principal and a union member, and there were reasons for that. To set the agenda, I had a central office administrator sitting on every one of the teams. Now you have to be careful when you do that. And the reason for a central office administrator with parents with the older students, we had students on board, community members, teachers, made sure you had a nurse there, made sure you had the custodian there. So we brought, it would look like a large team together. And the idea, even with the central administrator, was we, I needed to hear firsthand what the obstacle was. Is the obstacle when it comes time to feed our students? So we're going to have to get tents, we're going to have to get structures. We're going, whatever the obstacle was, we were going to solve that. And strategically, we brought before, and it took a lot of time, we had our principals working together, sharing some of the best practices, and we had to work very quickly. One of the things we did was during the school committee meeting, when we were ready, I brought an elementary principal to describe, we gave them a template, we talked about the process, it showed all the action steps, it showed the trajectory, uh, it showed the obstacles we were facing, how we were handling that, and we were out there sharing all of this information, as we would call it transparent, with everybody in the district so parents would understand. Now parents have choices right now. I am so pleased that there are some parents that still have their children remote, and there are many others that have their children coming back. And every school was a little bit different. You might have some schools, for instance, I had one school with first graders that made the decision that uh, three of the first grades would be teaching in person, and the other first grade teacher, and that was a change for some of the students, would be able to focus just on the nine or so students that were remote, so the clear attention could be on those students. So you, you asked again about you know how bringing kids back, it is all about building teams, making sure you're, you're sharing your data and your information, and it has been successful. We continue, if there is a challenge coming up, our team supports the principal and their team to make sure that our children are able to access the curriculum and are able to move forward. I think the second part of your question, I know the last part was uh, moving forward for next year. Mm -hmm. the, the middle part. I said, how would you envision helping our community, our students, teachers, and our families heal and move forward next year? I think, I think for everybody, and when I'm out there looking at students, it is amazing to me how resilient these children have been. I went into an elementary school the day after uh, we ended April vacation. I think it was April 26th. I spent almost three hours in the Nash Elementary School in Weymouth. And it has some substantially separate special education classrooms. Class size is probably of about 18 to 20 students. Most, you know, some teachers had a few students on remote. But when we looked at, and, and to come the morning after April vacation, 
and the kids were engaged in project-based learning. Their butterflies had bloomed. They were showing me all of the projects they were doing. In every one of those classes, I felt like our children were starting to, and, and again, it, it's not normal where kids have masks. You know, I'm looking beside each of the desks and you've come up with a place for all of their belongings to go. We can't have things in lockers. I mean, we're all dealing with all of the mandates that were so very important. But the truth is, people are starting to move forward. So how do you support that? So coming in, if I come in on July 1st, one of the first things I quickly will have to do is, and, and this is daunting looking at all of you, so I will tell you in both Weymouth and Salem, I was on board, school committee, we did a retreat, because I needed to hear from them what, what were the priorities for an interim superintendent coming in. It's a little bit different when you have a superintendent transitioning in, you're all on board, a new entry plan, you take a look at your strategic plan, you're meeting with all stakeholders. It really isn't a whole lot different for the interim superintendent other than they're going to be here for a short time. So what are the goals? We had a retreat in both Salem and Weymouth. And in Weymouth, when I did this in February, and I want you to know since I've been there, we've done two. And I have a third one coming up on, I think, June 12th. And that was, that was an ask from the school committee. The first one was an ask from me. And again, the five big rocks right away from them was return to school, make sure we get a budget passed, which included the full day K, continue our negotiations, take a look at the unfinished learning and communication, communication, communication. So when I come on board, if I am fortunate to be able to come on board in uh, July, that'll really be one of the first things I would need to do. And you are three distinct school committee, I think totaling 16 members, is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we will need to come on board and we'll need to talk because the superintendent does rely on, it isn't just about coming on board for the first time. If there ever is an issue in the district, you need to be using your school committee or school committees as that sounding board. You know, you are the one hearing from the constituents. You are the parents. You are the community members that are keenly aware of those issues rising up, especially when it's somebody new coming into your community. So to be able to talk, so when you say to me the healing, I would have to ask you, what is the healing that needs to go on? Is it children that maybe have separation anxiety? Now they're leaving home, coming into a classroom. You know, the, it's very different than when you're learning at home and able to, even for the oldest students, excuse me, you know, go to a bathroom, get a meal when you feel like, you know, getting it. Some of the kids loved it. You know, others, again, miss that socialization, miss those friends, miss seeing their teachers. I actually brought together this past Monday. We have a professional development day right now with an early release on Mondays, which we were able to keep for the rest of this year. And I brought together about 15 teachers. We we're all socially distant uh, in a, a cafeteria in one of our elementary schools. And I brought them in from every grade level because I am going to be presenting uh, on a panel with WBUR uh, NPR radio station on the 20th of May. I believe it's a webinar. And it is going to be about the very things you're talking about. How did we get through the pandemic? You know, what is going to have to happen when we are bringing kids back? And I didn't feel I had the perspective of the teachers down. And inviting them in, I'll tell you the one thing that surprised me, excellent dialogue. Some of the things I hadn't even thought of with what they had to do when they were trying to remote kids in, engaging middle school students and making sure that kids were understanding the concepts presented. And I watched a middle school teacher and after listening to her and talking to her, it was one of those things you say, I'd love my child to have that person for a teacher. And yet she got very emotional in talking about it. And it was the first time I sat back as the superintendent and said, and this is somebody that felt she was successful, but there were some kids that she couldn't quite reach and felt like she hadn't met all those standards. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, we're worried about children and social and emotional and adjusting to what our new normal will be. And are we paying attention to our staff members? And what does that mean as, as we re-engage? So I believe when you talk to educators, and I was on the beach last July. Well, I wasn't really on a beach. I was kind of holed up. But that being said, people during the summer, and you were a part of that as a school committee, as they know they were in Weymouth. And in Salem, I felt I at least had set them up with the task force and the groups that needed to meet. But I know when I hear my leadership team talk in Weymouth that that was a heavy lift 
that took everything that they could do to work with, again, their union, and not just one union, they were probably working with seven unions to make sure that we had a plan where our reopening of school plan and that we had hit the right marks to be able to somewhat, you know, bring kids back to school. I don't think this summer will be any easier. I think we're hopeful. So I'm hopeful that we will start to transition back to school. But by that same token, I have no doubt that it's going to take a lot of stakeholders together talking about really what are those priorities and not expecting that everything is going to happen overnight. So hopefully we will come up with a timeline. We'll have our educators working on when the children are coming from third grade to fourth grade. What are the skills those children have, again, you know, received during this time of uh, teaching during a pandemic? And, and, and some kids are going to be farther along than other kids, and that's okay. If you're a good teacher, you're able to, again, quickly assess that, make sure you're looking at children individually, and what are you doing to scaffold, you know, scaffolding instruction, differentiated instruction. Some kids need additional times, maybe they need additional support. So it is going to be, and that's just in one area. So we're going to have to be doing something that you probably did this past summer looking to, to reopen schools in, in September. All right. So are there any challenges unique to the role of interim superintendent? And how would you plan to address those challenges if chosen for this role over sure? Thank you. I think the biggest challenge, again, is, is coming in as a, a new person to your community. And I hope you heard me when I mentioned, obviously, the situation in Salem. I knew for me, and I knew what the challenges were at that time for that district, that I had to become a member of that community. And I spent that entire summer, and obviously school isn't in session. And I made sure that I strategically went to every, and I know it'll be different because we're in a different time, but I went to everything I could possibly go to, whether it was weekends, it was all in. If there was a, a ship in the harbor and they were christening the ship and truly that happened, I made sure on a Saturday evening and I loved it. You know, I, I was there, I was meeting people, uh, the mayor made sure that I had opportunities. It might have been the police chief, it might have been the fire chief, you know, all the different community organizations, the legislators. I made sure I had a, a beeline to Representative Paul Tucker and Senator Joan Lovely in Salem. And I've done the same thing in Wayman. Because to me, it's important that you work with your, your legislators, that they understand some of the challenges you know, that we're facing uh, in the district. I will tell you, I had somebody wise mentioned to me, and I haven't quite figured out how I would do this. So as a superintendent, I was so fortunate with the new superintendent induction program to have a mentor. And every superintendent should have a mentor. And mine was Dr. Jim Lee. And I kept up to me, the program is only a three-year program, and the mentor is there for about two years. Having uh, been uh, a superintendent in a large urban district, I kept him the whole time with me in Dalton. It was that sounding board to deal with challenges, somebody that I could go to, that trusting person. And when I was going to Salem, I said, Jim, you're coming with me. Because this is out of my comfort zone. What am I going to do to be successful so the district can be successful? And one of the things he said to me, and this is so simple, and again, I haven't figured this out, and I was asked this today by your leadership teams, is he said, you know, Kathy, you don't know your school committee. You need to get to know them. He said, if I were you, I would take the time to sit and meet with them. So I had six members in Salem. And I've done the same thing in Weymouth. And I ended up spending sometimes up to two hours. I would put it on my calendar, scheduled it during the summer. And it was really interesting. And I hope this gentleman in Salem, who knows how much I care about him, he was an older gentleman. And many times, he was a lone vote one way or another. And when I took the time to get to know him and to understand why he was serving as a school committee member, and to be able to communicate and make sure there were some decisions that I knew I had to have a separate conversation, or I had to explain <coughs> things, or, or share data, or, or knew how important it was to him. All the difference in the world. So to be able to get to know your you know, school committee members that we're going to be working very closely with, and they see you as a collaborative leader with them, you know, working side by side to really define what the issues are in the community. So those are, again, 
challenges that you're going to face because you're going to have to find the time. You're also going to have to find that time dedicated to developing, you know, and, and I so enjoyed meeting your leaders here today. You know, right away they were welcoming. You know, I could tell in just in conversations how dedicated they are, every one of them. You know, said, you know, it, it's a great community. We love working here. There's strong collaboration. They were all excited just to see each other. They were talking about a trip that they took to Finland at one point, and I could see the joking and the kidding, and I thought, this is the kind of place you want to be. But you need to take the time, and it's a lot of energy. You know, there's no, so all the while, you're trying to meet the community. You're trying to engage with stakeholders. You want to meet parents, and you want to be out there to meet the kids. So I'm not sure, again, if you are districts with summer programs or opportunity for a superintendent coming in to start to develop those relationships. We are still in the middle of COVID. So what kind of relationship building can you do? Is it just going to be you know, forums where you're on Zoom calls? So I would welcome, obviously, the school committee to share some of your thoughts on how do you make, and, and it sounds to me like you actually have had interim superintendents before, because there are districts that are like, we've never had an interim, you know, what does that mean for the district? And I'm starting to be a little bit sensitive to, to understanding what that means, and I can't be a success unless you are working closely with an interim. All the while, the other thing that the interim does, and I'm going to try with you right before coming into Salem, is you are you're setting the table to deal with issues that are still arising or strategic initiatives that can't wait a year. All the while, you're setting the stage for your permanent superintendent to be coming in. So if you have continued to develop strong leaders and you're supporting those leaders and you're making sure the things that your community values for your children, you know, are still those things happening. And I hope, and I said this to your leaders today, I understand I'm coming from a very different place. I was the kind of superintendent that would look on Bill Sherburn, I'd look on Wellesley, I would look on the websites to see what I could gather about what you were doing for success. I remember looking at Western High School when we were in negotiations, and they had a period a day where their teachers could collaborate every day. And I thought to myself, oh, and, and you know, again, looking at the success, and those were some kind of things that were definitely a challenge, but we were able to make some movement in our high school to look at a different schedule so our teachers could collaborate, could work together in groups, could start to share best practices, could start to open their doors a little bit and welcome people to come in so that you can grow in your practice. So believe me, I understand I'm coming from a different place, but I'm going to tell you I have a lot to offer you also. So there's a lot that I have seen in my career, or students that are, I have had to support, students that are undocumented immigrants that come to this country, and families that want their children, and for all of us, and for your children, you want your children to value that. And if they are going to be the global citizens that I'm sure that you are looking to create, you need to make sure that they have opportunities to understand other cultures, to value other people. Um, so I think I have a lot to offer uh, in, in those areas also. Thank you. And then I, just for the sake of time, I want to let you know that we have 10 more questions. I'm, I'm going to try to hold you to about five minutes per question, if that's okay. That is, I, I apologize. Okay, I'll just oh, I'll raise my hand when it's getting like around four minutes. No, don't apologize. Okay. Yeah, never apologize for passion. Um, so the next question is about communication. How do you describe your communication style? And how do you envision establishing clear lines of communication with the community? What type of frequency of communication have you found to be most successful? You clear? Absolutely. Okay. So um, my style uh, of, of communication is, is first of all, um, I believe I, I'm very collaborative. Um, as you can imagine, um, I and I'll talk about it at some different levels because because communication and I don't know if you saw me sigh when I talked about Weymouth and talking about that being a big rock. It is probably as a superintendent one of the most important things that you do. 
you know, whether it's communication when you first come on board so that your leaders are comfortable and clearly understand that you are there to support their leadership. That's what a good superintendent does. If I want the best out of my principals, out of the assistant principals, the district leaders, they have to be comfortable to be risk takers. They have to know that the superintendent wants to hear their opinion. So I am the kind of person that will come into a meeting very prepared, always driven by an agenda, although I think you've talked about one of the things that waylays me right away, which is getting involved in a topic and, and, and spending probably more time than I should. So executive team, I'll never forget New Weymouth after our first executive team meeting, which is about six of the top administrators. And this is where a lot of the work happens to make sure things are happening in the district. And one administrator finally said, you know, we thought this was going to be about an hour and a half meeting and three hours in. So we now have lengthened it. So and, and, and we get everything in. You know, everyone populates uh, that agenda. And again, I want to hear different opinions, different points of view. You know, let's, ha let's have a discussion to get to the point uh, of what we need to get to, to to solve an issue, to decide what best serves our district. When you talk about how best to communicate, so at my age, I'm going to tell you uh, again, and it's not about age, I know that, but I'm not necessarily on Facebook for a reason. I am the person at the end of the day, and sometimes I get frustrated with my young administrators who are multitasking and I see them on their phones and they're answering three or four things. I will wait to the end of the day and it'll be seven o'clock at night and I'm finally answering a hundred emails and answer them I do. You know, if there's phone calls to make, it's not unusual for me, if it comes to me, and many times it does, to call a parent in the evening, you know, and to have a conversation. And if it's been a problem, I find parents sometimes are like, oh my goodness, you called me. Yes, you know, you you, know, you went through the proper channels, et cetera, you met with your principal or you, know, you needed to hear, and many times, it is, thank you, superintendent, we're able to solve an issue or we're able to talk about you know, a, a reason why something happened. So I very much will stay on top of all those things, but it will probably come at the end of the day. But what is critical, and I'm happy to share with you, and I knew coming into Weymouth and pretty much in Salem, it seems like such a distant memory, but as far as Weymouth goes, one of the things I had to do was really open up the doors of communication. I was able to bring somebody on very, very part-time because it is critical for a superintendent, especially during this time of COVID, to message some things out to parents where they actually hear my voice and, and not to be overdone. But it might be a connected message where I'm talking to parents about the school vacation and making sure we're following the mandate so we're all safe, you know, coming back after the vacation, to making sure that you're sending messages with clear information so the people have the content of what you're doing to, let's say, bring kids back. There have been a number of other issues that I have had to deal with in Weymouth that I, I wish I hadn't. Uh, I'll, I'll share some of it with you. Uh, controversial issues that sometimes you have to take head on. And again, you have to be transparent. You have to be clear and you have to take a leadership position so the people understand you know, what, you're, what you are dealing with. So I send out, and I'm glad to share any of this with you weekly messages. I also found, because of some culture building, that during school committee I wanted to start with something positive, to talk about their community. And I can just imagine the positive things that are happening in Dover and Sherbourne, and the Dover-Sherbourne district. But to be able to start and show them some of the wonderful things, we recently had uh, Arbor Day, and, and I have to tell you my favorite story. And sometimes you have to add levity and I will finish up very quickly about communication, but I will tell you we had Arbor Day, and I loved it when the mayor, Mayor Headland, 6'5", big man, the kids were all excited, you know, the little kids are out there, they're gonna be planting three trees, and, and we're showing this to the community, and there are the kids with the shovel and planting, and right before the mayor gives a little talk to them, he looks at them to tell them, okay, the shovels are there, the trees are ready to go in the holes, and he looks at them and he says, okay, take it away. And all the kids are like, take it away. You know, we, our trees just got here. And, you know, it was it had to be the funniest thing. And I love sharing with the community these little children. And the mayor got so ruffled. He's like, no, that's not what it means. <laughs> but, but, to be, but to be able to, again, 
have those opportunities and say to Weymouth, what a great community. You know, you care about the earth. It's Earth Day. You care about your kids and you support your kids as a community. So to continue to get those positive messages out there, and it's not about not dealing with the tough issues because those are the really hard things to deal with. Thank you. Um, as an interim superintendent in an extremely engaged community, how do you balance the need to lead while coaching and mentoring those around you to foster the next generation of leadership? And you're talking about the district leaders. Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm a couple of couple of things there. You talk about a very engaged community, so that sounds very exciting to me. So you know, coming from um, and I'm going to say Brockton, where I was for 42 years, I did everything I could with my team because it was important for us to engage the community and make sure the parents that might have been marginalized, maybe because of language, found a place to support the community and we were very very successful in being able to do that in a number of advocacy events i can remember doing something i'll just talk on talk on this briefly where we had um funding issues with the um chapter 70 uh system for supporting especially places like brockton so we came up with a campaign called brockton kids count and we had a week all over the schools where kids were actually teachable moments, you know, writing essays, understanding the politics, understanding the support that they needed in their classrooms. And we brought over a thousand families together on the fields of Brockton High School and made sure I spoke to the bilingual parent, uh, we called it the bilingual PAC, our CPAC, making sure that the community was engaged. So when you go out there in the community and it sounds very naturally your parents are engaged in your community and obviously the most important thing to them, the education of their children. So it's important for everybody obviously to have that engagement. You talk about building leaders and I am somebody that grew up in the Brockton Public Schools and had that support. One of the things I always talk about is we had what was called an administrative internship program. And again, large district, 1,400 teachers. But what I liked about this, and I've talked about this in the other communities I have been in, haven't been able to quite pull this off yet, but we would put money in the budget and every year in Brockton, and we would interview starting in January, we'd put this out there to leaders, it could be a teacher in a classroom, that maybe had aspirations of becoming that principal, that assistant principal, that director, you know, some, something that they would want to do in the district. We would interview, and this was an agreement we had with our union, sometimes 40 members applied for this internship, and we interviewed every single one of them, usually could select about eight of them, and after April vacation, they would come in and they would do two jobs, and we were so smart when I thought about this. We made sure they were in schools during that eight weeks for about four weeks. So you had to walk the walk of an assistant principal, a principal, you had to be in the cafeteria, you had to be there for dismissal, you had to do all those not so fun jobs, all the while supporting instruction in the classroom. And then the other four weeks we had you working on a project. So the special education department would put in a proposal and say, I really need a booklet for our parents and our families about the IEP process. We want to talk about engaging those parents. I had the luxury of, I know when they looked at me at the time, I had just come out of law school, and they had a policy manual that was not as coordinated, coordinated as it should have been. So my job became, and, and I have to tell you I loved it, so looking at the policies, codifying them at the time before MASC came up with their process, we had a process in Brockton. I can still remember in 1999 having a booklet filled with pages of all the policies, all codified, you know, delivering them to all schools, being really excited about my project. We have projects now where our administrators, our administrative interns come together. We had live streaming finally for our graduation, which we hadn't had, working on technology projects. So there are ways every district is a little bit different, but you should always be knowing who your next leaders are and hopefully you do not want to lose leaders in your district. So if you have great teachers, and I'm hearing that's exactly what you had. I had a conversation earlier with one of your members who told me the teachers come here and they don't leave. You respect them, 
you pay them fairly, and you have high expectations for what you expect in your classroom for all your students to engage in your curriculum. So that's important, but you also don't want to lose those people. Now, there aren't jobs for everybody, but you make sure that you have opportunities, that you value those employees, and you see them as your future administrators. Thank you. Okay, so, so the matter that I'm going to talk about, I actually talked about this with some of your administrators, and I want you to know there were numbers of controversial decisions that had to be made. I think one that, that I took on, and when I say I was most proud of, I look at years later, looking back at the district and, and what it did for students, because that has to be the center of everything that you're deciding. What is the impact going to be on the, the students? Um, so we had a situation, and I'm not sure if you've dealt with this in Dover or Sherborne, um, but we had a situation where we had a school in Brockton, and it was uh, an older elementary school. We probably had over 600 youngsters in this elementary school. It was in one of the poorer neighborhoods. It was a school that had been built, oh my goodness, I think it was 125 years old. It was called the Huntington School in Brockton. And lo and behold, it had no cafeteria. The kids had a small cafeteria downstairs. This was built at a time where kids went home for lunch. And they would have meals brought in. So there was never really a hot meal prepared. There was no gymnasium for the kids to have gym classes. All of those things that we expect nowadays. No music room, no opportunities for those extracurricular type things. So we ended up building at the time, and, and I don't know whose foresight this was, but in Brockton when we had money to build five new elementary schools in early 2000 and worked with MSBA, we built, we went from smaller neighborhood schools that were old and were excited to build at the time 1,000 students in an elementary school, which is really very large. So we ended up with another elementary school open. So I'm trying to have you follow this and then I'll get to the solution. For a short amount of time, we put our very youngest special education students, our uh, preschool students, in this particular elementary school. They had lots of room. They had gyms, a working cafeteria, rooms for the speech pathologist, room for the occupational therapist. Everybody had rooms. And these were students that stayed there for a couple of years before they integrated into our elementary schools. And lo and behold, I had these elementary students. Before I came on as superintendent, I knew that it had failed as far as not being able to be passed by the school committee to move the students from the elementary school to the elementary school that was op would be open for them. And I had another place to put our preschool students, actually a, a very nice building. But in order to make that happen, I had to spend, I want to say, the good part of over a year collecting data you know, talking about why it made a difference for students that were going to be there from kindergarten through fifth grade. What we were, and it was a turnaround school. We had an extended learning time grant there. The children were learning. They had access to, we worked with Bridgewater State University. We showed great gains. They had a, a program where they went to, on the college campus during the summer working with college professors. We were really hitting it out of the park there. And those kids deserved this opportunity. It wasn't a new school but it was a school that would best support them. And our little kids, well, I wasn't very popular, but I had to go and stand, and I had to understand the impact on the school committee. I had to understand the impact of that vote. But in the end, when we assured the school committee that when the littler children went to the other school, we would make sure they had everything. It was a beautiful school. 
to go there to this day, and, and while I was superintendent, it did happen. I made sure I was there often. I made sure I watched what those little kids were getting, and they were getting a great education there. And at the same time, to watch the children that came from a school that was really kind of falling apart and having an opportunity and are having an opportunity to this day, as long as you take the proper steps and you're communicating every step of the way, sometimes it's not a popular decision, but it's a decision where people understand and you're then held accountable beyond that. If you say you're going to do something to make sure the children over at the preschool have what they need, you make sure that you're, you're checking those so-called boxes. So it's, um, it's a lot of hard work, it's bringing a lot of stakeholders together, and sometimes uh, you wouldn't want to run for office. <laughs> and I understand you have to. <laughs> Thank you. So um, this question is about educating the whole child. So the question is, as a district that places a high priority on academic achievement, how would you align parents to the importance of educating the whole child? Uh, I think I think when you look back, uh, and if you've looked at my resume and you've heard me talk a little bit, one of the things I talked to you about was, you know, um, being a teacher of special education students that had, you know, serious disabilities. And I learned very early on, it certainly was about reaching those academic marks. You know, these students weren't going to succeed if I wasn't able to teach them the skills that they needed to move on. But more importantly, I hope what you heard, and when you look at my background, it is important for children to understand their value to understand social and emotional support and when you as a district have done the good job you've done and here's what i mean when you have class sizes of 22 and, and even lower for some of your early grades what you are providing so when you hear me talk about being that teacher in a substantially separate classroom it was the best teaching not only that i ever did and here's what i mean I had 12 students in that room. They were protected in that classroom because of their disabilities. But what that meant was I had to understand every one of those students. I had to understand not only their IEP, you know, what the objectives were that I had to get to with quarterly reports, all of the other support staff that came in. If I sent those students out to be integrated into a classroom, I couldn't just send them out the door. I had to make sure I modified curriculum, worked with teachers. That is just good teaching. It isn't about being in a special education classroom. It's truly understanding the children you have in front of you. A good teacher sets that tone right away. Children come into the classroom. They have to understand their children. They have to understand what the families are dealing with. Are there certain situations that families are sharing with them? Maybe a child is anxious. Maybe there's somebody sick at home. You know, maybe they're a, a shy child. There are things that if you right away are welcoming to those parents and not putting up any barriers, making sure that you're reaching out and saying, you know, dear family Smith, I'm so excited that we're going to work together in this upcoming year. These are the things that will help your child be successful in the classroom that I'm going to do for all students in the class. And I need to know from you a little bit about your child. So it isn't just about that opportunity when you meet the parent. You know, I can remember parents, and when you're dealing with uh, some of the students that you're dealing with, many times teachers will call home when there's what? When there's an issue. And you want parents, and, and I have to tell you, when I have done that, and I tell this to teachers when I talk to them, when you're on the phone with a parent, and I mean this parents that are listening, one of the first things that you say when you call a parent is, is hi, Mrs. Smith. You know, this is, you know, Mrs. Jones. And, you know, I'm calling you about Susie, and I'm really going to need your cooperation here. You know, the dialogue changes because now you're working together to do something to support the child. But I am going to tell you, and I know in this day and age there's different ways of communicating. It isn't really picking up the phone. But what about sending a message when the child does something really good? Mrs. So-and-so. 
you know, so-and-so, you know, was able to, you know, they led the debate today. They were head of the debate team. You know, they were the student that welcomed a new student into the classroom. They were, you know, sometimes just being able to do that, you know, supports uh, our youngsters uh, and our families. And you know what? I kind of forgot about the question. I get really excited about about the message. Um, I'm sorry. It was so, it was communicating. I have it written down. Educating the whole child. Loudly. Um, so basically, this district places a high priority on academic achievement. Yes. How would you align parents? to the importance of educating the whole child, not just right. academic achievement. Right. I'm, obviously, when, when you're rated number one, that must be hard if you're constantly looking to keep that. And I'm sure that that's exciting. How exciting is that for a district to be in the top 10 in the state or to your children are getting accepted to wonderful colleges? But you have a whole community of students here. And it's really good to be excited about those students but I'm sure you have students that are great artists, that are great musicians, that are students that maybe are average students, but are really successful and doing the best that they can possibly do and are really good at doing other things. So I think parents need to be comfortable with that. And the other thing that I find very helpful, and we did this in, in certainly in Brockton and we started to talk about it in the other districts, is we put together parent academies. And we put them together for, for many different reasons. And you have very engaged parents. But that doesn't mean that you don't set up for the whole year opportunities where you strategically bring in speakers to talk about educating the whole child, to talk about the role of the schools, the role of the parents. How are we creating that successful adult? That's really the question. Is it just about the student that is going to be number one in their class? I think that's great. But not everybody is going to be number one. But what about that student that leaves you is successful, whatever they have chosen? You know, those are going to be the marks of excellence, I think, that you bring forward. Thank you. <laughs> so you actually answered a little bit of this question, so I'm going to change a little bit. Um, you talked in generality, really, about how you can help, help educate parents with the importance of educating a child. But can you share with us a specific instance of when you had to um, deal with the competing priorities of maintaining high academic rigor and meeting the child's specific needs? Um, I think honestly, when you talk about you know academic rigor in the districts that I have come from, you know that is sort of certainly the catalyst for everything that we do, is to make sure that children in the classroom have opportunities to reach their highest potential. So I have to make sure that we're educating teachers so that they understand what their role is to reach every child. You know, whether it is a student who, again, is talented and gifted, because they present additional challenges for you, and I'm sure challenges that you're facing here in abundance, to make sure that those children have opportunities. Are you looking at college and career from the point of before they even get to college? Do they have opportunities for AP classes? I'm sure they're in abundance. Have you looked at international baccalaureate programs, which actually give your students some independence in programs, where families I know would be very supportive if they are so concerned about the academic pieces of that? All the while, again, making sure that your teachers have all of the tools they need to reach every child uh, in the classroom. If part of me is wondering if in the conversation here, because I have looked at one of the programs you have, is when you have, and, and I've actually studied this a little, not because of Dover Sherborne, because I find it really interesting, when kids have high expectations or are in a community where there are high expectations for all students, what about the anxiety that children feel to, to just keep up? So I think that that is a particular skill, and people in the community have to be comfortable understanding that it isn't just about academic high achievement. You know, what again is, what do you value in your children? You know, do you value that they are able to excel, you know, playing a musical instrument? That's probably an expectation. Do you value students at a very young age uh, being biliterate, biliteracy? 
So when you look at where I come from, we took a negative, and when I say a negative, little children coming to us not speaking a word of English, and we said, wait a minute here. And I loved when we developed, and it was right before I left, we actually pulled it together. We started it my first year as superintendent. We built an international school. We had embassies working with us, where we have children that come in, children speaking Spanish as their first language, English as their first language, as kindergartners, going all the way up through the system. And now you have youngsters, again, that are biliterate, getting the seal of biliteracy. We had a program for Spanish and English, we had a program for Portuguese and English, and we had a program for French and English. And that was the international school that we created. So uh, again, it, it does depend on what a community values. Uh, I would be really excited about coming here and talking about what you have. You know, are there things that you can add and grow to the community? All the while, you know, respecting that you have students that could be struggling students. So what are we doing for our struggling students? How are we making sure that they have equity and have access to all that you have to offer in this community? And are your parents educated? And when I say educated, take part in you know professional development where we have these conversations. And I'm going to guess, you know, kind of looking at the audience, that sometimes this might be difficult conversation. Um, but I, I think that it's worth bringing, again, parents on board, professional development for teachers, you know, all the while respecting all of the students that you have in the district and their capabilities. Thank you. I just want to let you know while you go ahead, uh, we have about 15 more minutes for the questions and then we'll uh, check with you to see if you have any questions. I'm sorry, 15? We have about 15 more minutes for our questions. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so I think that this question may be very related to what you just answered, so I'm going to change it up a little bit, but it relates to student achievement. So describe uh, your view of student achievement extend beyond academic growth and give concrete examples of programs and priorities that you believe would, would benefit the DS community. I think you kind of hit on that a lot just recently, but maybe expand a little bit in terms of the changes that you feel like you would be responsible for as an interim super, and maybe how that change would be communicated to the broader community? You know, I, I probably did answer it somewhat, and I think when I first sat down, I said to you, I hope you're open-minded enough to, to know that when somebody comes from someplace a little bit different, there could be some real value that they're bringing to your community. So I will tell you uh, in Brockton, uh, as a, a young administrator coming up, sometimes there were real concerns for me with who was the top students in the music program and who were the top students when it came time for a National Honor Society because I felt it didn't look like the community that we were representing. And I'm so proud in the end, and this again was changing a mindset about what student achievement could be taking a look at advanced placement classes and not taking somebody out who really, if you challenge them, and I'm not saying challenge them to the point that you're creating anxiety, but knowing how to support those youngsters so that they have access to those programs. And always looking at ways, when you heard me, heard me just talk about you know biliteracy, turning around what we felt was a challenge and making it something to this day I'd love you to go and visit, was very positive. Taking a look at international baccalaureate program, not just at the high school, but looking at the middle school and bringing Chinese into middle school students in an urban setting and having them be successful, having them do exchange programs, having you know things that were just, you know, uh, parents couldn't even have imagined that they would have this for their youngsters. So I, I will tell you in the end, I couldn't have been prouder that when I looked at, and it wasn't just being superintendent, I have to be honest, it was in a number of jobs I held, now becoming superintendent. When I left and watched who was walking across the stage during a National Honor Society, it looked like Brockton High School with 4,200 youngsters. When I looked at who had the leads in the play or who was performing, it looked like Brockton High School. When I looked at who was in our you know, symphony, and we had award-winning music, art, all of those things. I was so proud that that was our success, that kids had access, kids were successful, they were valued. Uh, again, we had more challenges than I can shake a stick at, please understand that. But you know, these were things that we were able to bring for all kids to have that opportunity. 
and by the same token, I'm probably not speaking a language that you have here. I do want you to know, because publicly I would have to say this, is we had multiple pathways for kids that were not successful at a 4,200 student high school. So what are you doing for those students? To lose one student was important to me. You know, to make sure that if we needed a pathway for students, whether it was therapeutic support, whether it was students that had gotten off on the wrong track that were overaged, undercredited, what were we doing to make sure? And we would match a thousand students across that field each year, and they all weren't from Brockton High School. They were from other pathways to get them to that point. So I, I, I know I'm answering it a little bit differently, but, but I want you to hear that when you have good leadership and you're talking, continually talking about ways to do the best that you can for your students and all students and making sure that they have opportunities to grow, then you're certainly servicing the community. Thank you. How do you define anti-racism, and what role, if any, do you believe it should have in public education? I think anti-racism uh, is is something that we have had. Uh, you know, it, it's been around forever. Um, so racism has been around forever. When you talk about anti-racism, it's truly educating your populace and making sure, and it is probably, and, and I think we all have to admit right now, it is a very difficult conversation. I'm not sure about you, but whether it's the political climate, I know that I have had difficulty having conversations during the past year, uh, during our uh, presidential election. You know, sometimes having conversations that, that just didn't feel quite right. But I'm actu actually very hopeful at this point that because of some of the things and some of the dialogue and really where we are right now, that the time is right to start to have conversations about being accepting. And again, seeing the value of making sure our children are accepting of all different cultures. You know, what's the cultural proficiency? We spent a lot of time in Brockton, and you can imagine we had very large numbers of um, when I talk about you know English language learners, people from all over the globe came to find Brockton home. And I always felt that it made us a better community if you were willing to get to know your neighbor, if you were willing to, you know, to be part of a solution, and certainly being able to you know, talk about the value of, of understanding a different culture. It just isn't about the dishes they serve. It is about, like people would say, and you've probably heard this before, we would have teachers say, I can't get so-and-so a parent to come into the school. You know, the parent is um, not willing to have a discussion. And when you really start to unravel it and dig a little deeper, there are ways to reach communities. You know, there are ways to have conversations with parents. Sometimes they're not really sure what their role is. So we spent a lot of time constantly doing professional development and educating our staff to understand all of the cultures of students that we had uh, in our district. And also, I think one of the hardest things is, Right now, with uh, teachers, especially in your higher level classes, you know, is it taboo to actually have conversations about the political dialogue out there? Is it something that we want to walk away from? And we can't put everything on the teachers. We have to make sure that they are able to have conversations with each other and are able to you know, come up with the tools that they need to really kind of take a look at themselves and to really take a look at your own behaviors and see if you are willing not only to have this discussion, but how are you going to lead the discussion with your children? So um, I have recently started to, whether it's reading different books, um, whether it is starting to take a look at some of you, all of us love to say, well, that's not me, that's not who I am. And then you look, about, look at your own internal biases and you say, wait a minute, you know, maybe I need to do a reflective look. And I will tell you this, I learned this the hard way also, when something would happen when I was superintendent and I can share with you a story where our students were playing in a basketball game and they were in a wealthy community on the South Shore. As you know, when there were playoffs, you go to different places, and a chant started to erupt. 
and it was something to the point of, I don't know if it was build that wall, it was something. Mm -hmm. And it really created an uncomfortable feeling. And the superintendent of the South Shore town and myself got together as superintendents. And there were people walking down saying, that's not what those students meant, you're jumping to conclusions. Whether we were or weren't, we talked about teachable moments. And we talked about coming together as two superintendents from very different communities and appealing to the communities to be able to, to have that dialogue and to be able to have conversations with our team, with their team. And we didn't make it anything bigger than it was. But I'm going to bet you there were teachable moments for students to learn as to how people came together. And the other thing that unfortunately we relied on, many times I would go to our teachers of color and say to them, we have an issue. And I always expected they were going to carry the ball until one of them came and said, you know, for us, some of this feels traumatic also. So please understand where we're coming from dealing with some of these issues. And that was really what I needed to hear. Like everybody else, you know, we're all in this together. But until us as educators start to say, we need to have these dialogues in class. It's not to create, uh, because you have to be ready for different opinions. And again, you want to create an environment that kids feel comfortable. So you have to be very careful of certainly ages that you're serving. Make sure you're prepared. Make sure you've done professional development and your teachers that are having this discussion have the support of their administration and are prepared for um, any kind of fallout from the communication. But I do feel it's important to have those, those issues discussed. Thank you. Give us an example of a tough situation that arose in your school system around racism and inequity. How did you resolve this with your staff, students, and community? Well, I, I think I've just really kind of talked about it at length, you know, uh, in Brockton. Um, and again, it was, I told the story to your educators today, and, and I'm going to tell you the story. I, I kind of walked around it a little bit. But I want to say it was early 2000, and I had gone up to Brockton High School because we had a speaker coming in. And the speaker was uh, a mayor, and I believe I'm telling you this correctly, out of Philadelphia. His name was Philip Good. And he came as a motivational speaker. And I looked at the audience at Brockton High School, and it was our ninth graders. We could just about fit a class into the auditorium. So there were about 1,200 youngsters sitting in the auditorium. We have probably at the time about 70% minority students sitting there. And the speaker was terrific, really enjoyed the speaker. And then I looked up on the stage, and up on the stage was our award-winning band. We always roll them out when somebody special came, you know, entertain, you know, show the talent of our students. And I looked up there, and I don't know why it took me by surprise. My own children had gone through Brockton High, had been in the, you know, instrument classes, had been in the band, all of those things. And I thought, it, it's embarrassing because that the band does not reflect our district. And I worked from the time I was an administrator till I shared with you about the success becoming the superintendent of making sure we had all kinds of additional support through grant money, through academic support money. So our after school programs, again, were all about academics, narrowing that achievement gap, but also giving kids opportunities for instrument lessons, making sure they had opportunities for art, the theater, sometimes not being able to compete with other families that were able to get you know, individual lessons for their children. So by the time I left, honestly, and it's not something that you share, it's not really in a speech, although I'm sitting here sharing this with you right now, um, I couldn't have been prouder when I looked in my last years as superintendent, and I thought this was my vision. My vision was, this is our Brockton. This is where every kid had the opportunity to be the first trumpet. Every student had the opportunity to perform and continued to perform in a wildly successful you know, music program. Or again, those students you know, that, that were the artists you know, showing their artwork or the top students in our class. So looking at you know, the valedictorian, sometimes kids that hadn't been in the country uh, very long, had parents that wanted that education for their students and were willing to entrust them to our district 
to be able to make sure that those kids had equity and opportunity. So that was, um, I, I would say that would probably have to be the most successful uh, initiative. Thank you. And we have one final question. I'm not sure who's um, going to take Amanda's question. Yeah. We were going to we were thinking that jump over that one. She might have already answered that to a lot and to allow some time to jump to Maggie's. Is that a good Why don't you ask the last question? Thanks, Lynn. Okay. How would you contribute to our district's commitment to enhance diversity, equity, and inclusion? This is work that is starting in, in many districts and probably work that we should have started a long time ago. So when you talk about diversity, I know that you are a, a METCO district. Um, I believe your, your community is changing uh, and there is diversity uh, in the Dover, Sherbourne community. You know, are you, again, supporting your educators and your families by looking at cultural proficiency? Are you doing a curriculum audit? Are you taking a look at how children are por portrayed in stories? Are we still reading the same books in our English language art classes that you and I were probably reading years ago? Are we looking at new literature? Are we looking at things so our kids see themselves, and it isn't just about seeing themselves, do they see the world in, in what we're presenting to them? As far as inclusion goes, are you going out of your way to welcome people to your community, to making sure that if you have booster clubs, you know, do you have parent involvement in your parent councils? Looking at your school committee, you know, are you welcoming those new people to your community so that they actually have an active role and you're listening to their voices? I explained to you the story about advocacy in Brockton and making sure that it wasn't just going to be the same people throughout the city. I loved when I could drive around all sections of Brockton and saw those signs on every lawn that said Brockton Kids Count. I see the bumper stickers to this day because we went out of our way to make sure everybody was going to be part of what ended up being a success for us being the Student Opportunity Act. As far as equity goes, you have to make sure that you're comfortable giving additional resources to kids that need additional support. And it isn't just about tiered instruction, which your teachers, I'm sure, do very well. I talked about differentiation. But it also is, are you allowing them extra time? Are you giving them extra opportunities? Are you providing extra support for those students? And it isn't just about narrowing the achievement gap. It might take them a little longer. And my favorite, favorite photo, when you talk about equity, and if you haven't heard Dr. Tyrone Howard, so as an urban superintendent co-chair of the Urban Superintendent Network in the state, we brought Dr. Howard to our summer retreats twice. And it wasn't just about to hear a speaker, because it's not enough to just hear a speaker. You have to internalize it and you have to really look at your district and see if you're doing all of those things and all of you have seen the three little kids trying to look over a fence and you've seen those faces and one kid is tall and can see over the fence and the other kid happens to be shorter and needs a taller box to look over the fence so they both have the same view. And that's the view that you have to have as a district. And I'm sure that you have done these things for youngsters. You know, because you're here, you want all youngsters to achieve. But sometimes it is going that extra mile and being comfortable to say that one child might get something that another child doesn't necessarily need. Maybe they need additional technology tools. You know, they need support of, you know, certainly counselors in the district or, or sometimes maybe they need a buddy. You know, we have buddy benches, you know, throughout the district, something that I was very fond of to make sure my uh, youngest daughter, who is 35, will say to me, you know what, Mom, I want to thank you because you can imagine I'm a school adjustment counselor in the district that she's going to school in. She was in a different school, but I would always, again, be working with the students that didn't have a, a friend group, you know, that were alone at lunch. And I would say to my daughter, if you see somebody sitting alone at a table, you make sure you go over and invite them over. And I love as an adult, she says to me, Mom, to this day, it doesn't matter where I am, I make sure I go over and invite that 
person, you know, to join me. That sounds like th- something very small, but it means a whole lot. And I love when I go into schools and I see a buddy bench where a student goes out to recess, sits on the buddy bench, and another child can come and take them to, to join the group. What better way to teach our kids? So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have about five minutes left, and we want to make sure that we get a chance to hear any questions you may have. Well, um, you know, I, I, you have had an interim superintendent, um, I, I had just realized. So I, what is your expectation uh, of somebody coming into the district as far as, you know, what are your priorities? Some of it I can gather, obviously, by the question. Um, you're looking at, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, it looks to me like you're looking at, again, uh, your students that are high achievers or a, a community being willing to, to take a look at other things other than just academic achievement, and I understand how important that is. So what are, are I talked about the five big rocks that I quickly you know, had in Weymouth and have been working on. You know, what do you see a, as your priorities? Who wants to take this one? I, w- I would like to suggest Maggie, maybe, from the regional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that for us, or for, for me anyway, a big priority is that we not lose uh, momentum on a lot of really good work that people have done. You know, we've been extremely fortunate to have put, been able to get our kids back in schools much earlier than some other folks, mostly because we have lots of space in small classrooms. Um, and wonderful teachers and dedicated people doing that. But um, I, I think we've been on a road with a strategic plan that has a year left on it and probably needs some work. We have really talented people ready to get the work going, to revision it. But we don't want to spend a year not making progress. Mm-hmm. Um, and we want to make sure that the great leaders that we have feel cared about and valued and you know, make sure that they feel supported on sort of what you described in terms of growing leadership. I, I think it's great for me. That's great. Does anyone want to add to that? Kate, yeah, I think you know, like all other districts, um, coming back into school in the fall and after a crazy year, and making sure that. Um, Kids are okay. Staff are okay. Having having as smooth a transition back to a new normal as possible. And I think it's also important to, to, to that we take this year, um, you know, spending time for us to look at our strategic plan and um, and um, revitalize it for the next five years. But it's also it gives us a good opportunity to look at look at our our governance, look at our, um, you know, our organization, our organizational communication and our interaction, and say, how are we doing? And 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 how how do we position ourselves going forward? Okay, I think I think we have a year where we can do a little bit of planning, um, and I and I think that's. Um, you know, coming off of the pandemic, it's as though we have to kind of regroup and and get back to what what are our goals, what are our values, what is our mission, um, and and what have we learned that we can take forward with us. Um, and I think that to me, it's really important to do some assessment and 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 regroup. It's very helpful. Do you have any other questions for that? No, I, I just, it's its interesting. Um, you know, again, a, a different community, and I, I brought these, I think I spoke about it, and it was so important uh, when we looked at, again, our large urban district, and we lost kids to other communities. Um, it's not for everybody. Um, there were charter schools, and, and to me, I felt I wanted everybody to choose our district, that it had so much to offer. And I love uh, one of the last things, and it took, it took a while to do this, was to put together, and it was called Choose Brockton. 
And in this is, again, everything about the district that, to me, when you open it and you look at it, you would want your children to be part of, of our district. And, and I know you probably have your families choosing Dover, Sherborne, rather than going any place else, and I imagine that. But it's always good to have you know, that kind of communication that really talks about all the hard work and what you have going on. And the other thing that I talk about is this was born out of frustration. And I had very good relationships and made sure that I worked with city councilors, legislative representatives. It was important that everybody understood the challenges that there were going to be changes to be made and changes happened. And I'll never forget um, being with the mayor. The mayor did his state of the city and there was just a very tiny part for the schools. And I thought, well, well, that's not right. You know, we're the largest you know, departments certainly in any district, uh, any town, um, and we ended up putting together, and it's called the State of the Schools. And I've done this in each of the districts, and this here is successes and challenges, very different than kind of your marketing. But it was important to make sure that, you know, you're highlighting all of your programs, you know, and letting people know, here's our success, but here's our challenges going forward. So I have found these, uh, these are just a couple of things. Like I said, I have all kinds of things I'd be very happy to share. But thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So our, our next steps are we're meeting on uh, Monday the 10th again uh, in, in on Zoom, but in public session. And um, we, we hope to have a um, come away with a vote that night, and we will be in touch. Okay. Well, thank you for being very welcoming, and yeah. I can't thank enough to your to your district. Um, you know, as I said, um, you become very busy as superintendent, but this was absolutely worth it today, and I really enjoyed. Um, again, your assistant superintendent was wonderful, making sure I had everything uh, I needed um, from your administrative assistant to your department heads, and certainly, again, you have wonderful school leaders. So I wish you the best of luck. Thank, thank, you. thank you for your time.